I'm Jeff Weissoff from Niffin Photon Science, and it's my pleasure today to be able to introduce uh, New York Times best-selling author Andy Weir for the book The Martian. Um, interestingly enough, I heard about this book for the first time from the scoutmaster from my troop, and then I've been hearing from lots of people, and by the way, we've crammed this auditorium today, it's clear there's a lot of interest in, in hearing the story about this book. Um, it's a pleasure to have Andy here, not only because, you know, as a community, we're interested in, in, in good stories and, and especially stories that evolve along kind of science themes, but um, Andy also comes from a National Lab family here. So he started his career at uh, Sandia National Labs doing programming and has been a software uh, programmer since then. And his father, John Weir, is a retired uh, physicist from the laboratory who was active both in lasers and accelerator physics. In fact, I think John's here today if he could stand up and just be recognized. So uh, as I understand it, you know, Andy is a self-proclaimed geek, like many of us here. He enjoys studying uh, orbital dynamics and uh, the, the history of the manned space program. And you know, this book that he's written is you know, not about the best day NASA had, where they inadvertently leave an astronaut behind on Mars thinking that he's dead and they have to leave because of an emergency. And the story unfolds from there, where he has to uh, pit himself against the uh, inhospitable nature of Mars to try to survive until he can be rescued. Um, this book has you know, gained a lot of attention, and because of that, uh, they're going to make a movie out of it. Uh, Ridley Scott is the director, as you may know, also directed Aliens. And uh, Matt Damon is going to be the star as the protagonist, uh, Mark Watley, in the movie. So uh, without further ado, I think uh, what we're going to do is, is quickly show a, um, a uh, uh, trailer for the movie, and then we'd like to bring uh, Andy up to the stage. Every human being has a basic instinct to help each other out. If a hiker gets lost in the mountains, people coordinate a search. If an earthquake levels the city, people all over the world send emergency supplies. This instinct is found in every culture, without exception. At around 4.30 a.m., our satellites detected a storm approaching the Ares 3 mission site on Mars. The storm had escalated to severe, and we had no choice but to abort the mission. But during the evacuation, astronaut Mark Watney was killed. <laughs> I'm entering this log for the record. This is Mark Watney, and I'm still alive, obviously. I have no way to contact NASA or my crewmates, but even if I could, it would take four years for another manned mission to reach me, and I'm in a hab designed to last 31 days. So, in the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm gonna have to science the shit out of this. Okay, let's do the math. I gotta figure out how to grow four years worth of food here on a planet where nothing grows. But if I can't figure out a way to make contact with NASA, none of this matters anyway. Houston, be advised. We've got a video message. It's directed to the whole crew. Play it. My God. <laughs> Mark Watley is still alive. In your face, Neil Armstrong. We left him behind. Let's go get our boy. This is something NASA rejected. So we're talking mutiny. And if we mess up the supply rendezvous, we die. If we mess up the Earth gravity assist, we die. Space. It doesn't cooperate. I guarantee you that at some point, everything's going to go south on you. And you're going to say, this is it. This is how I end. Is it possible that he's still alive?
please uh, join me in congratulating Andy Weir on the success of his book and welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to test the roaming mic. Can you guys hear me? We're good? I'm broadcasting? I love the sound of my own voice. <laughs> so I always wanted to be a writer uh, ever since I was a little kid when I read my dad's inexhaustible science fiction collection. He had, uh, it, was a, it was a bookshelf about six feet high, three feet wide, one foot deep that was like jam packed full of classic uh, 50s and 60s sci-fi paperbacks. So I grew up reading kind of one generation off. Um, I grew up reading Heinlein and Asimov and Clark and I loved those books and that's, that's I wanted to write books like that. Um, but when the time came to choose a, a college, uh, a path to follow in college, um, I decided that I liked writing, but I also liked regular meals, and uh, I wanted to sleep somewhere other than a park bench. So I went into computer programming, which was good because, you know, by the way, I grew up here uh, in Livermore. I'm a local. I went to Livermore High School. I was listening for booze from Granada alumni. <laughs> Um, um, and uh, I actually I started working at Sandia Labs across the street uh, when I was 15 years old. Uh, they had like this community outreach kind of thing where they, uh, they hired local kids, local teenagers to basically be test tube cleaner kind of stuff. And um, they hired me on and uh, the lab I worked at said, well, we don't really need someone to clean up, but we do need someone to write software to analyze data. So there's a computer. Here's a book on how to program computers. Go figure that out. And that's how, that was the beginning of a 25 year career in software engineering. So anyway, I went to college for programming computers uh, to learn how to program computers. And then um, I, I attended college for four years and then dropped out without a degree because that's what my generation does. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I, I ran out of money. And it was at the time when the tech industry was wildly popular and you could make pretty good money just by wandering into a computer company and say, give me a job. And so it was hard for me to justify continuing to pay for college when I could just instead work and get paid. So I ended up doing that and I was a programmer for quite a while, but I still always wanted to be a writer. So fast forward a bit until, uh, oh, it's, it's, sorry, it's worth noting that while I was in college, I wrote a book and it was really bad. Um, it was uh, so bad that even at the time I wrote it, I was like, this is bad, this is crap. <laughs> and the good news is that it was, I wrote it so long ago that um, it, uh, it was before the internet existed. So there's no digital copies out there. <laughs> no one will ever find it. There's, there's only one copy still in existence that I know of, and it, my mother has it. And um, she won't tell me where it is. <laughs> um, so then, uh, you know, I'm just uh, being an average, everyday computer programmer, and I really enjoy that profession. It's fun. I, I like it. And I, was, I got better at it and better at it, because if you do something for 25 years, you eventually stop sucking. <laughs> um, and uh, when I was uh, in 1999, I was working for America Online. Oh, by the way, back earlier in 1995, I worked for Blizzard, and I was one of the programmers on Warcraft 2, which gives you, <laughs> there we go. That still gets a big round of applause. <laughs> Best-selling novel, movie, that's nice. Warcraft 2? <laughs> Dude, I lost a year of my life to that game. <laughs> so um, anyway, in 1999, I was working for AOL. I mean, in the, in the software industry, if you're, if you're at a single job for three years, you're an old hand. Uh, in 99, I was working for AOL, and I got laid off along with 800 other people when they merged with Netscape, which kind of gives you a a time reference of like how long ago that was. And I had uh, a whole bunch of stock options with AOL that I hadn't paid attention to. And I'm like, well, and they said, by the way, you have 60 days to sell your stock options or they, you know, evaporate. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'll sell them. Well, that turned out to be AOL's all time peak. <laughs> so I assure you, I would not have made a wise financial decision left my own devices but I was forced to. And so I ended up with a bunch of money. And so I'm like, oh, okay, I have, I have a bunch of money. I don't need to work for a few years. I can live, a, I, I can live several years off of, off of the money I have in savings. So I'm gonna take three years and I'm gonna write a book and I'm gonna try to break into the industry. So I did that. I, uh, I took three years off. I wrote a book. That book was not The Martian. You haven't heard of that book. 
because once again, I couldn't, uh, this, this time, unlike the first book, which I knew sucked, the second one I didn't know it sucked, and so I tried really hard to get it published, but it's the standard tale of woe that every author will tell you. Couldn't get an agent, couldn't get any publishers interested, it just couldn't get any traction. And after a while I said like, well, okay, it's been three years, um, I took a shot. I, I, I tried to live my dream, now I don't need to wonder what if, time for me to go back into computer programming. And this wasn't a big defeat for me. I like programming computers. It's a, it's a, it's a job that I like. It's a, it's a culture that I enjoy. And so this wasn't some like hang my head in shame and crawl back to the industry. It was like, oh, okay, well, I didn't get to do this, so I'll go do that. Um, but I decided, all right, I still want to write, but I, it's not ever going to be my profession. I was wrong. But um, <clears throat> so what I'll do is I'll write and I'll post it on this new fangled World Wide Web. I'll, uh, I'll start posting short fiction to my website. I'll make a website and post things there. So I made some web comics and I made uh, short stories and I made some serials. Uh, I also made some fan fiction. There's Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Who fan fiction to be found on my site if you look. Um, so uh, I also, back in 2009, I wrote a short story called The Egg that was very popular. And that kind of made the rounds and it got more people uh, kind of signed up for my mailing list. Around the time I started The Martian, it was one of three serials I was working on at the same time. And um, the other two were, let's see, the other, one of them was about aliens invading Earth and the other one is about a mermaid in 19th century New England. <laughs> so I have eclectic tastes. Um, <clears throat> I was working on those three serials at once. I had a modest mailing list of about 3,000 people. Uh, which seems like a lot, but remember it took me 10 years to build that up. So it's not that big a speed of like, you know, snowballing readers. Um, so while I was writing The Martian, I was like, oh crap, my readers are like me. There's, they're, they're picky little snot-nosed brats when it comes to science, which I am. I'm the worst. I'm like all of you. You, I, you read something and you're like, well, that's not right. I'm, I'm just taken out of the story entirely. So I, I, I wanted to make sure that dorks like me could enjoy the book that I was writing. So I put a huge amount of effort into being as scientifically accurate as possible. I also put a huge amount of effort into procrastination. I didn't, <laughs> and, and it was fun to do the research. So I ended up doing more research than I had to because it's more fun than writing. Um, it took me about three years to write The Martian, uh, posting it a chapter at a time to my website, about one chapter every two months or so. And I'd get feedback from my readers and they would tell me all the mistakes I made. And so I would correct the mistakes and, and so on. And so it was pretty solid by the time it was done. So once I finished, I said like, okay, I'm done with The Martian, on to working on other serials or other whatever. And I started to get email from people saying like, hey, I love The Martian, but I hate reading it on your website because your website sucks which it does. Um, and so I said, like, uh, you know, what do you want me to do about it? And th so they said, can you make an e-reader version? Just post it, an e-reader version to your site. So I'm like, OK, I made an e-reader version that people can download and put on their e-readers. There you go. Then I got other email from people saying, like, hey, I, I love The Martian, hate your site. I, s I see that you have an e-reader version. That's super, but I'm not very technically savvy. And I don't know how to download a thing from the internet and put it on my e-reader. Can you just post it to Amazon so that I can just use their system? Because I know how to do that. So I'm like, OK. So I figured out how to do that. Amazon has this whole self-publishing system called KDP, which stands for Kindle Direct Publishing. Any idiot can use it. Um, <clears throat> And all you have to do, you just, there's no initial cost or, or financial risk, which is what I liked about it. You just post your thing up there and it goes up for sale. Well, with a few caveats. Number one, you're not allowed to give stuff away for free. You have a minimum price of 99 cents. Because Amazon doesn't, Amazon actually loses money on the Kindles they sell. They make their money off of selling stories and content. So they're not going to let dorks like me give stuff away. They want their money. So I set the price to the minimum 99 cents, meaning I was pulling in a cool 30 cents a copy. <laughs> and um, then, uh, then I said, you know, I posted it. And then nothing happens for 48 hours because they want to make sure that they have a human look at it just to make sure you're not posting a bunch of goat porn. So <laughs> don't judge. <laughs> so. Um, once they post it, then I announce to my readers, OK, everybody, you can uh, read it for free on my website, download the e-reader for free from my website, or you can pay Amazon a buck to put it on your Kindle for you. Knock yourselves out. And more people paid the buck than got it for free, 
which shows you a couple of things. First off, um, uh, Amazon has a huge reach into the readership market. Just the number of customers they can access is so astounding, it's, it's insane. And two, people are willing to pay a buck to get around technical hurdles, especially if they've already got the system set up. It's like, hmm, I could push this button and have it on my Kindle right now for a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, people liked it. Uh, people started giving it really positive reviews on Amazon. It scored very well. It started snowballing. Uh, one thing worth noting is my, my core readership, those 3,000 people, had for many years been emailing me every now and then saying like, hey, can I donate to your site? You know, because people like to donate to the site maintenance costs of, you know, stuff like that. Well, uh, I always said, no, uh, I'm, I'm an engineer. I make lots of money. I can, this is my hobby. I don't mind paying for it. And I would feel bad if people who make less than me are donating money to me, right? So I'm like, no, I don't take any donations. I don't have PayPal things set up for that or, at all. And so now all these people who had been wanting to find an excuse to give me money now saw like, oh, your book's on sale. So they all bought it, even though they've already read it. So they all bought it. They all paid a buck. And that helped the initial sales spike. And that, um, and that, plus the good reviews, plus people recommending it to each other, got it into the top sellers lists in Amazon. And so th that started to really snowball because once it got into like the top 10 in science fiction, then it really started going because um, you know, you're like, oh, I don't know what I want to read. What are the top sellers in sci-fi? I'll buy one of these. Got up to number one pretty quickly. And then, um, then unbeknownst to me at this time, <coughs> In, uh, in New York, uh, uh, an editor named Julian Pavia at Random House, what had, uh, someone had recommended the book to him. And he was thinking about it, and he's like, I don't know. I've read the reviews. They're very positive. But at the same time, it's very, very technical. I don't know if this is, has mainstream appeal or if it's just engineering porn. I'm not sure. <laughs> so he, he's talking to his colleague, a literary agent named David Fugate. And he said, David, I don't know, if I, I don't, I don't know about this. Uh, and David said, like, well, I'll read it. You know, I'll, I'll read it and I'll let you know what I think. Julian's like, sure, go ahead. So David goes off and he reads it and he's like, oh, I like this. And he contacted me and said, do you need an agent? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so after uh, three years earlier in life of not being able to get an agent, I mean, the polite ones were the ones who sent rejection letters, right? Um, now I've got one knocking at my door. So I go online to make sure he's a real person and then, <laughs> And then uh, I'm like, sure. And David's like, all right, Julian, how much are you going to give us for this book? So that was pretty cool, a little predatory, but that's how it is. <laughs> so while they were working on those negotiations, 20th Century Fox came and said, like, hey, we want to talk about the movie option. So that's pretty exciting. <laughs> um, movie options aren't as exciting and overwhelming as you think they are. It doesn't mean, like, you know, since we're here to buy the movie option, we're we want it, we're going to make a movie. No, it just means um, they are securing the exclusive ability to get the movie rights. So they pay you a small amount of money to have 18 months during which no one but them are allowed to buy the movie rights. That's what an option is. So it's not that exciting, but it's interesting at that point to have a studio, you know, a major studio like 20th Century Fox come and want, this, want the movie rights. But my agent and my film agent, everybody said, like, don't get too excited. They only make about one movie for every like several hundred options they go secure. So it's not, don't, don't get too excited. But I was excited. And um, then they eventually, eventually like both of these deals are being worked on. I got my, my uh, literary agent working on the uh, print deal with Random House. Got my film agent working on the movie deal with 20th Century Fox. Meanwhile, I'm in my cubicle fixing bugs. Because I'm still a computer programmer at this point. And so, sitting there in my cubicle, fixing bugs, running off to take a phone call about my movie deal, then back to the cubicle. <laughs> so it was, it was a really surreal time. And in the end, the, published, the print deal and the movie deal were agreed to four days apart. So that was an eventful week. I had to take a day off just to go home and lay down. <laughs> <laughs> so once the print deal happened, we went through uh, a few editing passes. It wasn't, it, it wasn't that invasive, actually. Uh, I'm told that it was a very mild, uh, editing process and then it came out and it sold really well and it got under the New York Times bestseller list. So that was good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> Pause for clapping. Okay. <clears throat> then, um, so meanwhile in movie land, um, Drew Goddard, they, they brought Drew Goddard on to write and direct the film or at least that, that speculatively. 
And uh, he really liked the book. So Drew Goddard, by the way, is a veteran uh, screenplay writer in Hollywood. He wrote a bunch of episodes of Lost and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He, he directed Cloverfield. He, uh, he, or, sorry, he wrote Cloverfield. He directed Cabin in the Woods. So pretty big deal. Um, and he really liked the book, so he, he, he wrote it to, um, to, to follow the book. He wrote the screenplay to follow the book as, as well as possible. And um, he was originally set to direct as well, but then Sony came along and offered him the director's chair for uh, the next Spider-Man movie. And so he's totally a superhero guy. I don't know if any of you have seen the, the new Netflix Daredevil. He wrote that too. Um, so uh, he's like, oh, I gotta do this. So then the studio was like, oh, oh. They're like, well, we've got a screenplay now, but no writer, no, no, no director, no nothing. And then Matt Damon said, hey, I'm interested in playing the lead. And the <laughs> studio was like, Okay, okay, now we're taking this seriously. But now that we, we have a big name actor who's interested in playing the lead, but we don't have a director. And so Ridley Scott came and said, I'll direct it. And they're like, really? <laughs> so at that point, it was pretty much green-lighted, although I didn't know it. Um, and then uh, eventually, it's just one of those things where all these things just snuck up, just bit by bit. They snuck up. It was like, Ridley Scott might be interested. Ridley Scott is interested. Ridley Scott's in negotiations if he can find it, you know, time in his schedule. If we could, uh, okay, Ridley Scott's on board. Okay, now, now, we're, now we need a female lead. Well, uh, Jessica Chastain has expressed interest, and it's like, we got all these big name actors start piling on, and the studio was like, whoa, 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 everybody, we can't afford all of you. <laughs> Go away, we've got Matt Damon and Ridley Scott, they're expensive. Um, but a lot, of those, uh, a lot of these performers you saw are working for less than they would normally get just because they think it's a cool project. So, yeah. Um, uh, so the movie comes out, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So on the, uh, I get to fly out to Toronto actually next week to watch the premiere on the uneventful date of September 11th. <laughs> and, um, and, that, and then the, the film comes out in general release on October 2nd. So um, the first question, I'm about to turn it over to questions from the audience, but uh, the first question I always get asked uh, is like, what did you have to do with the movie? So I'll go ahead and pre-answer that question for you. Um, uh, mostly my job on the film was to cash the check. <laughs> so that was my main responsibility. But uh, they, 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 so all they had to do, like seriously, in the contract it's like, we will give you this pile of money and then you get to go to the premiere. That's, that's it, right? That's, that's all that's in the contract. But they chose to involve me, which was really cool. When Drew was writing the screenplay, he, he called me almost every day to ask questions, some technical, some storyline questions. When he, got the, uh, when, he, when he was done with the first rev, he sent it to me for feedback. Uh, I gave him lots of feedback. He made some changes based on it and ignored other things. It's his screenplay. And then once they were filming it, I would occasionally get these questions filtered through from Ridley through multiple intermediaries because he doesn't email. Because when you're that age, you don't have to use technology. <laughs> um, and, he, um, and he would ask, it was, really, it was actually really heartening to see the kinds of questions that were coming through from Ridley. It's like, one of the questions was, hey, um, can we show Watney pouring hydrazine from one container to another out on the surface of Mars? So he's in his EVA suit and he's just pouring it from one container to another. I'm like, no, Mars's atmospheric pressure is really, really low. The hydrazine would just boil off. And he's like, okay, then we won't do it. I'm like, okay, that's what I like to see. That's, that's good, that's good. Oh, one other thing before I get to questions. Um, there are a few places, uh, so I put a lot of effort into being technically accurate, but there are a few places where I'm not. And uh, the biggest one is the sandstorm at the beginning. In reality, uh, Mars's atmosphere is about, um, uh, what, half a percent of Earth's atmospheric pressure. So they do get sandstorms and dust storms that are 150 kilometers an hour, but the inertia of the, of the wind that's hitting you would feel like a one kilometer an hour breeze. So it wouldn't damage anything. I knew that was the case when I wrote it, and I decided to look the other way because I wanted it to be awesome. Um, <laughs> I, I had an alternate beginning in mind at first that had, um, like they were doing an MAV engine test and there's an explosion and that causes all the problems that uh, lead to Mark being stranded. But I decided against it because it's a man versus nature story and I wanted nature to have the first punch. 
The other deliberate inaccuracy I had was um, I really hand waved around the radiation issue in space. Um, and it, it, I, I just have like a paragraph or two in the book that say like, oh yeah, the HAB, the rovers, my EVA suits are all radiation shielded. <laughs> in reality, that's a huge problem and there is no thin, you know, light, easy material that completely takes care of it. So realistically, having gone what he went through and being on Mars for so long, Mark would have so much cancer as cancer would have cancer, but <laughs> they have, a, it's a magical technology that they developed between now and 2035. So, um, yeah, and then there are things that have been sent, that have been invalidated in the story since the book was released. So, those bastards at JPL landed Curiosity <laughs> on Mars. And so, so, those of you who have read the book may know that there's this, a huge part of the plot is uh, him having to create water. He has to take hydrazine and reduce it to liberate the hydrogen, then he gets carbon dioxide from the atmosphere outside, runs it through the oxygenator to free up the oxygen, then mixes the hydrogen with the, are we, we've got ghosts? Yeah. Um, you mix the hydrogen and the oxygen, burn them in a controlled way, and yay, you've got water. Well, so Curiosity went to Mars and went, scoop, there's a shitload of water in the soil. <laughs> and, and it turns out for every cubic meter of Martian soil, there's about 35 liters of water in it. So what I say for that is um, Mars does not have a single solitary climate, just like Earth doesn't. We have the Sahara and we have like the Amazon, right? They're very, very different climates on Earth. Well, Curiosity's in Gale Crater, which is about 5,000 kilometers or so from Acidalia Planitia, where the Martian takes place. So I say Acidalia Planitia is a desert, and no one can prove me wrong until you send a pro. <laughs> hey. The, the other fun, uh, another fun thing that has since happened, you know, since the book has been released, the new PLISSES, which the PLISS, Portable Life Support System, that's the backpack part of a space, uh, space suit. Um, the new PLISSES have the ability to separate carbon dioxide out of the air without any filters, without any expended materials at all. They can just do it forever. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, NASA. So <laughs> then, um, <clears throat> And uh, what was it, there, there's one more thing. Oh yeah, so the University of Arizona runs the high-rise instrument on Mars uh, reconnaissance over, orbiter. So MRO is in orbit around Mars and it does really, really high resolution mapping of Mars. It's basically a spy satellite and it can take pictures with a resolution of 30 centimeters per pixel. So 30 centimeters, one pixel in the image is a 30 centimeter square on the surface of Mars. It's like that high a resolution and so one thing in the book, I say exactly where the HAB is in Acidelli Planitia, the exact latitude and longitude coordinates. And so the people who run the high-rise instruments said, let's see what's there. <laughs> and so they took a high-rise picture and they're like, this isn't anything like he described it. <laughs> but it was pretty cool. So anyway, I'm, I'm uh, ready for questions. So. The lovely and talented Melissa here is going to uh, hand the microphone off to whoever wants to raise their hand and pass it ballpark peanuts style. So the trailer opens up with some of your words from the very end of the book. And when I read those, I found them, I don't know whether depressing is the right word, but it was, it was kind of a, that, that, that doesn't feel like it ends anything. It feels like it opens up a whole new kettle of fish. If we are going to, or if we we're all excited about rescuing this one guy, what, what else ought we to be doing with, our, with ourselves and with our effort? Uh, well, I don't address that in the book. <laughs> I don't. I, the, the book isn't about telling you the direction mankind should travel. It's, uh, it's just solely for entertainment. That, that kind of bit at the end is just... I don't know, it's, it's, it, it is my kind of optimistic view on human nature. I do think we're an inherently good people. And we, I mean, you, you, you see all the bad things in the news, but you don't see the thousands of good things that everybody does. And it is like he says in the monologue, it's like if a hiker gets lost in the mountain, thousands of people go look for him. And it's just understood that that's gonna happen. It's abnormal when somebody shoots up a movie theater and so it makes you know, international news. So, on the whole, humans are so inherently good and cooperative that it's not notable when they are. So. We have a question. 
Can you hear me? Yep. Um, thanks for telling us the background about publishing or getting the book published and the movie rights sold. I wondered when you quit your day job. Um, I quit it, yeah, in uh, last April, so April of 2014. So uh, pretty much as soon as I knew that The Martian was going to be able to financially support me. Um, it wasn't like this, you know, take this job and shove it situation either. I, I liked my job and I liked my coworkers and I liked my boss and everything. So it was kind of bittersweet. And it was like, well, I'm leaving a thing I like to follow a dream that I've had. Um, so when your book was the leading one on Amazon, was that in volume or, uh, um, you know, m it's money? Sales rank. Sales um, rank. So that's so volume. It's, well, Amazon does their own thing. They have like secret formulas. So it has to do with, it's not just straight up volume. It has to do with volume and like recent volume, kind of like the you know, first derivative of it, like the, the rate of sales. It's something complicated. So the dollar that you were charging wasn't, wasn't a detriment in uh, that scenario? Correct. I don't think they, I don't think they, uh, I, yeah, I don't think the sales ranking, I don't think the, the price affects the sales ranking. I think That's it's number great. of units. That's great. <laughs> yeah. No, nope, not anymore. You can't get it for that. <laughs> no, once I sold, well, yeah, once I sold the rights to Amazon, they, uh, they jacked up the price of the, I'm oh, sorry, once I sold the rights to Random House, they jacked up the price of the ebook and also asked me nicely to take the free version down off my website. <laughs> so uh, I just got a question. I mean, you have a, there's a great line in the movie, right? About science the shit out of this, mm -hmm. which is an awesome line. I'm just curious, is that your line or is that <laughs> from the screenwriter? That's from Drew. So everybody's saying like, oh, science the shit out of it. Andy, I love that line. I'm like, tell Drew. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write it. <laughs> it's not in the book. <laughs> it's a great line. I wish I'd written it. <laughs> Anyone? Here. Bueller? Right here. Oh, okay. There are a lot of different viewpoints that you incorporate into the book on Mars and at NASA. Was there one that you wanted to bring in or one that you wanted to expand a little bit more? No. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, so the, you know, the, 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 so the, the viewpoints, any, anything that's debatable or disputable in the book is all about like what's the best way to do this science or that science or something like that. Um, and I, ex I, I showed a Mars mission profile that I think is a good idea. The uh, mental images that you had that you created in your mind as you're writing the book and uh, then later get extrapolated into the movie, how do they compare to what the movie had? And uh, is there any place you stored the ones that were in your head before the movie came out, you know? Uh, for the most part, uh, so a lot of the equipment, so the hab looks exactly, almost exactly the way I imagined it. So the hab in the film looks pretty much identical to how it was in my mind. Um, Hermes looks utterly different. So the, the ship, the, um, it looks very, very different from what I imagined. Um, I didn't really have a vision of what the individual people looked like. Uh, I didn't, I, 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 when I'm writing, I tend to have like, okay, here's a blob of protagonist. I, like, so when I finished the book, I couldn't have told you what color Mark's hair was or anything like that. It's just not, I don't know, it's just, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't come into play in my mind. Um, I did have some physical traits in mind for some of the characters. Like, um, I mean, I knew some ethnicities, like, you know, Venkat Kapoor was ethnically Indian. Um, Mindy Park is Korean in my mind, and not in the film, because Park is also an English surname, so they didn't know I meant that she was Korean. Um, uh, but for the most part, I didn't really have anything. I didn't even know ethnicities. It was just kind of, it was much less visual in my mind. how you wrote the book that uh, so you did a lot of research but also it was a bit of a collaborative effort with your uh, mail list subscribers um, so do you think you can reproduce that level of accuracy science accuracy in the future or is that maybe too daunting now no I, I don't think it's a problem I mean my my readers found kind of some minor issues here and there where it's like oh you got the chemistry wrong on this here's the correct way to do things or oh you didn't quite get the physics right here but it wasn't like oh, you got this massive thing wrong that affects the plot. It's the sort of thing that can get caught in by, I, I, I'm pretty sure it would have been fine. Like even if all the mistakes that were caught by my readers had gotten through, it wouldn't have been that big a deal. I would have just had a few more points of, oh, here's some things I screwed up. One of my favorite ones though is um, 
uh, a reader emailed in and said like, hi, I'm a chemist. Uh, the hydrazine reduction thing you did, absolutely perfect. Yeah, that's exactly the way it would work. But um, <laughs> you, you told me how much hydrazine he reduced, how long it took him to reduce it, the volume of the hab, and the makeup of the air inside the hab. From that, I can calculate the amount of increase in temperature that the hab would have, and it's 400 degrees Celsius. <laughs> So, I could have dealt with it. I could, if I'd known, I could have dealt with it. There's a lot of ways to cool things down on Mars. But, uh, yeah. So, I follow up the question before. Was just, um, so, you got, obviously, when you write a book and you got a screenplay, and we've all read books, and you watch the screenplay. Not that just, guy. Well, except for him. Uh, you, and you, you go, wow, this is, like, either way different, or they left out my favorite part. Right, so I'm curious if there are any things like that where you just kind of went, yeah, why did you do that? A couple. There's a, <laughs> the, no, no, not the changes, but just a few omissions. They had to take stuff out or it'd be a 10 hour movie, right? So, but the, the one thing that hurts the most is that they took out my Aquaman joke. <laughs> oh. they, put it in the, they put it in the marketing material. So there's a, that joke makes it into the marketing material, but it's not in the film. And I'm like, oh, come on. That's the best joke. Real quick, uh, you had 3,000 members to your mailing list. How many do you have now? Oh, well, I don't really maintain the mailing list that much anymore because I'm not, I, yeah, I, actually, I don't know. I should check. <laughs> so uh, in the book, um, is there a reason why you didn't go into the personal relationships that the main character had, I mean, you seem to really kind of avoid that, and that's one of the questions in, in the end of the book, and I just wanted to know why, why you chose not to kind of personalize him with like a love interest at home and give him something to fight for to help us visualize, you know, what he's internalizing, his survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, well, mostly I was, I was really focused on it being a plot-driven story. I didn't want it to be about a man's fight against crippling loneliness and isolation and, and the deep psychological aspects of that. So I was able to get around, I, I just want MacGyver on Mars, right? So I was able to get around those, uh, that sort of stuff by saying, well, Mark isn't just some guy who was walking down the street. He's an astronaut. He beat out like thousands of other applicants for this, you know, for this position. He was selected for like the third manned mission to Mars. So he must have a psychological profile that's a little bit better than the, than the average person. That's how I got away with that. Now, the, uh, the thing about having connections to Earth and stuff like that, I don't, I don't like that usually in movies or books or TV or whatever because it seems really artificial. It's like, oh, I want to live because I want to get back to my daughter. It's like, no, I think you want to live, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, oh, I don't have a daughter. I'm, I'm dead. No, it's just... <laughs> so... The desperate desire to survive is more than enough, and I, I didn't want schmaltzy kind of like family connection stuff going on. And I really hate decompression scenes in, in stories. I don't like it when stuff's going on, stuff's going on, stuff's going on, now we're going to have a slow part where he's arguing with his girlfriend or something. I'm like, no. <laughs> okay. Yes? Ghost of Christmas past? In the, in the book, uh, you kind of ignored SpaceX being any way of a player in this, but uh, you certainly are. So. Yeah, they certainly would be. Uh, people have forgotten how quickly SpaceX came onto the scene. When I was writing the book, no one had heard of them. Like, pretty much, they were, I mean, so I started writing the book in 2009, and SpaceX, uh, I, I, they were probably around, but they weren't, they certainly didn't have contracts with NASA to supply ISS or anything like that. It's, they have really come about very quickly. If I was writing the book again, I would certainly have them be, you know, the people who provide the booster or something like that. Uh, hi. Uh, I think most, uh, most authors, you know, kind of model their characters after, you know, people they know or... Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of wondering, you know, uh, who he's modeled after, if it's anybody from Sandia or if there's any other... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or any Hi. other... Uh, Mark is definitely modeled after me, but he, he, has all my, um, he has all the things I like about myself and none of the things I don't like. So 
He's Are there, is there any other type of like treasure hunt that people should look for in the movie, like some kind of inside knowledge of National Labs or something like that? Well, <laughs> maybe a little, but um, talking about Mark, um, he is, I don't know if you've noticed, I'm kind of a smart ass. And so he, he is modeled after my personality. He's everything I wish that I could become. He's the idealized version of me. Pretty much any main character is someone the author wants to be or someone the author wants to screw. <laughs> don't believe me? Pick up a book and see for yourself. You'll, you'll see. It's one of those two. For the record, I want to be Watney. Now, <laughs> as, as to your other question, I actually did use the culture at Sandia because I didn't know anyone in aerospace when I was writing the book. And so I'm like, I don't know what it's like inside NASA or at JPL or anything like that, but I have worked for a large federally funded research facility. So I just kind of projected those kind of like ways of doing things, those attitudes, those politics, those personalities into NASA. And NASA people have told me it's dead on correct, by the way. <laughs> so, so that's really cool. In fact, the one thing I hear from NASA and JPL is that the biggest, the biggest inaccuracy of the book is the high degree of cooperation shown between NASA and JPL. <laughs> okay. Who else we got? Um, looking back now, is there anything that you would change about the book, like uh, plot-wise, or if anything more were to happen? Um, well, I, th th some of those things I mentioned where technology has since invalidated things, I, I, I would like to update that, like the, the correct polices and the, um, the, the amount of water in the soil. I would, I would at least throw in a lip service that says like, oh, unfortunately, Acid Alley is a desert, and I can't do all this, da -na -huh. um, <laughs> I'd take care of that uh, temperature increase problem. Actually, he would, he would run into that on his own. Um, uh, one thing, uh, so a couple of things. First off, he mentioned SpaceX. If I had to do over again, I would have um, commercial space flight be involved in his assistance or rescue or something. Um, another thing is, he, uh, another thing that has come, uh, come into prominence so much that we forgot it ever wasn't around is 3D printing. So at the time that I wrote it, 3D printing like, it wasn't even a thing. But now it's like they have a 3D printer on ISS. So I would have, he would have had a 3D printer in the hab. And then, which because I'm an evil, malicious god, he would have had problems that he needs the 3D printer to solve, right? <laughs> so. What can you tell us about the book you're working on now? Um, it's tentatively titled Zhek, Z-H-E-K. It's a more traditional science fiction, less rigidly technically accurate and, and more fantastical. It's, uh, it's got aliens and faster than light travel and stuff like that, but done my way. I came up with my little kernel of bullshit physics and then <laughs> everything stems from that. <laughs> and the bullshit physics is not in conflict with any real world physics. So uh, everything's internally consistent. You can't violate conservation of momentum or energy, or you can't violate Heisenberg. You can't screw with causality. So it, it works, but I had to have some made up physics for it to work. Uh, I loved a lot of your one-liners at the end of a lot of your, your, your sections. One of them I really, really liked was, everything was going great until the explosion. <laughs> yeah. I love that line. Uh, but there's one more that I have to ask you. It's on page 13, by the way. Oh, well, okay, yeah. <laughs> we all know that line. Are you really a Cubbies fan? I am not a Cubs fan. I just thought that would be just the thing to make Mark's pathetic situation even more pathetic. <laughs> like, poor bastard. I am actually a Boston Red Sox fan. So there we go. And she's wearing a Red Sox thing right there. I see that. I heard some groans. Are they Yankee fans? Out. <laughs> Out. Mm -hmm. Giants is good. Yeah, so I was interested in, uh, you chose not to give the rover GPS, and even though you had... Uh, well, that's tricky when there are no GPS satellites in orbit around Mars. Well, you had satellites, though. Yeah, but they didn't have... Commu uh, I, for the conceit of the story, I had to deny them any communication. Right. And uh, well, uh, right now, if you were on Mars, you would not have GPS. The, uh, the, the orbiters that we have there are not broadcasting a GPS signal. All right, well, is that it? Is everybody fall inside? Oh, a question in the middle. Oh.
did any of those initial 3,000 fans try to give you writing advice as opposed to <laughs> science advice? Um, not advice per se, but they would tell me what they did and didn't like, you know? They'd say like, ooh, I loved this part, or this part seemed to bog down a little bit, that sort of thing. But it wasn't exactly like, oh, let me tell you about show, don't tell. You know, it was like, <laughs> yeah. Huh? So uh, in, in your case, it seemed like you were an overnight success in six years. <laughs> uh, looking back, are the things you could have done differently to shorten that period? I don't know. Um, it took me, you know, quite a while to write the book um, because I had a day job at the time and stuff like that. And it took me quite a while to learn how to do narration with like, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of words I had written in short fiction before I even started The Martian. But there were two entire books before it and a whole bunch of short stories. So I think, it, yeah, I think you have to pay your dues. Like I said, you, you keep doing something long enough, you stop sucking. <laughs> or you suck less, anyway. <laughs> I think there were, okay. I'm curious about your personal opinion of disco. I like disco. <laughs> disco will never die. I like disco. All my friends give me crap about it. <laughs> oh, uh, we're doing hip. OK. Uh, what current science fiction author influ influence you think the most? It influences me? Or, yeah, or just you like. Or, or I enjoyed the most. Um, uh, my favorite contemporary sci-fi author is Ernest Cline. He wrote uh, Ready Player One. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah. So, so that's, that's my favorite current uh, sci-fi author. Um, uh, but uh, the, my, my holy trinity of authors are Asimov, Clark, and Heinlein. So those are the ones that I really grew up. <laughs> yeah, those are the ones I really like. Uh, for the software developers in the room, what's your favorite programming language? Uh -huh. And can I interest you in a potato? <laughs> you can keep the potato. Um, I get given a lot of potatoes. I have, yeah, I have a mailing address, I have a package receiver where you can send books to be signed and stuff like that, and people send me potatoes. With just like the address written on the potato and like stamps on the back of the potato. Post office will deliver that. Um, my favorite programming language is C++. Uh, what He's having potatoes for lunch. So. I'll, I'll eat them. I just don't like anonymous potatoes. It's candy from strangers and it's not even candy. So I think we are done. Okay, so thank you everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you.